guys? Welcome back to the Waveform Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Marquez. And I'm Andrew. And uh, uh, what are we talking about this week? We have WWDC this week. I mean, it's hard not to talk about it. Um, there's obviously a whole lot to talk about. So before we take a Craig dive into that WWDC hole, we're just going to check out a couple quick stories we have beforehand. Do you like that? I thought of that right before. The Craig dive. I the swear Craig. he does it for the memes. It was too good. Um, yeah. Okay, the, the first thing we have here, I, I, I wrote this down because I wanted to just just present some numbers just to, to hear it, just so you guys can hear the numbers. Uh, there's four iPhone games that each gross more than a million dollars per day. Yeah. And I just want you to think about that. Just like, okay, there's a lot of, there's obviously a lot of people that use the iPhone. There's a lot of people that play mm-hmm. games on the iPhone. And there's a lot of microtransactions and ways for those developers to make money from those apps. But the top couple, uh, I think I'm going to, I think we wrote this down real quick here. Uh, the number one, Roblox, makes an estimated $3.01 million per day. That's in revenue. Nutty. I know how popular Roblox is. I feel like it's similar to Minecraft Fortnite levels of hype. And it just really is proving that this whole like microtransaction free to play platform is a moneymaker. Oh, yeah. I, it, I just, wild. what do people buy in Roblox? I don't like even know. Skins. And, oh, just straight I mean, skins. Wow. That's what I think. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. I don't think it's a game that has a whole lot of competitive modes to it so i don't think there's much you can get in the game that would actually give you a competitive advantage over anything um usually microtransactions in pc xbox stuff games don't give you uh any competitive advantage you just get like aesthetics yeah but mobile games are one of those games where you can get a comp like if you think of um i don't know if you ever play like clash of clans or boom beach there there are a lot of these games boom where beach it, it's called boom beach, boom yeah. beach okay. it, it was pretty much like you develop a, a like island base and you go around and attack other island bases Um, tower defense game similar but like the thing about it is is imagine in a tower defense game if you built one of your towers and then you have to wait 24 hours before you can build anything else until that tower is complete but if you're willing to spend tokens or whatever spend money on tokens you can make that you can build it in a second and then get better at the game by paying some more money so it's generally a lot of these games are time-based i think claire was even playing like the sims and in the sims you can like do an action or build something in the house and then you have to wait x amount of time and you can pay to do it faster Mm -hmm. so there are actually these like competitive advantages in a lot of these mobile games which is probably why they're making so much money yeah so roblox is number one three million dollars a day uh, then you got Clash of Clans in a distant second with an estimated $1.8 million of daily revenue. Then Candy Crush Saga would be your number three. And Pokemon Go at number four. Yeah, those is... are like, they don't post, they didn't put how much they make, but there is another number here that is the top 10 iPhone games generate almost $11.2 million daily. Hmm. Yeah, this is one of those like great stats yeah. where like, okay, uh, if you were to separate you know, sometimes remember how we if we separated just Max from Apple, yeah, just yeah. Max would be like a Fortune 500 company just because of how much revenue they make from Max. Mm-hmm. I feel like if you just separated the top five to ten games oh, yeah. on the App Store by itself, that company by itself, eleven million dollars a day. We do the math. That's yeah, a lot of money. Now, so <laughs> the first thing I thought of this. When you posted this is we've talked so much about Apple taking 30%. I had to crunch the numbers um, because what's 30% of 11.2 million? That means Apple in profits just from selling. I mean, it sounds weird to say just from selling this. They're clearly doing other work. They're doing customer support and processing transactions and everything. But they're making 3.3 million daily in profits just off the estimated top 10 games. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of apps on the App Store, right? Yeah. But there's a couple That's wild, a couple huge ones that yeah. just make them a ton of money. Well, you know what? Good for Apple. Good for good for Apple for building such a massive app store that they can afford to uh, just give that platform to everyone. But yeah, wow, that's a lot of money. Good for them. Good for Roblox. <laughs> actually, I didn't realize they had that much that much active user base. Uh, all right, we want to talk about Twitter Blue though. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have so, to. 
Twitter Blue. How do I describe Twitter Blue? I've been asking for a bunch of paid features actually from Twitter for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I'm still sort of hunting for some of those premium features that I would like as a creator. But as of right now, Twitter has announced their subscription service called Twitter Blue. Uh, and they're starting to roll it out. And we are hoping, maybe, at least I was hoping, maybe, editing your tweets after a brief period would be one of the features. Mm-hmm. For those who are already typing into your keyboards why it's such a bad idea to allow editing tweets, you can watch my Dear Twitter video where I explain exactly how mm-hmm. I think editing tweets should work, which was, you know, it should be a very limited amount of time that you're able to edit tweets. It's a limited amount of characters you're allowed to change, and tweets show a change log in a history. Yeah, so if change log deleted, is huge. Yeah. If a tweet's changed, then you know if I retweeted something and it gets changed, obviously I can, I can see that. Anyway, uh, so what does Twitter Blue allow for? Twitter Blue will cost about $3.49 Canadian or $4.49 Australian per month. So we're guessing, well, I, I'm not good at conversions, but I'm thinking that's around $3 a month USD. Something it's only like only available in those two because those are the two, only two regions it's out in right, right now. Right, where it's launching. Mm-hmm. It gives you a bookmark folders feature to let you group saved tweets to make them easier to find later. I Do you save tweets? Not Really? No, no, like if we ever really need them, we screenshot them for like a video or something. But I don't think I've ever saved a tweet. I didn't know you could save a tweet, to be honest. I also honest. use Pocket for free. Oh, okay. so. Adam was just teaching me about that the other day. I've never heard of it before. But, yeah, so that's um, free. There's also reader mode, which lets you keep up with threads by turning them into an easy to read group of text and mashing all the tweets together into one page. That, I think that's kind of interesting, but for a reason that to me makes no sense for paying. Um, I have I have friends that just don't use Twitter and when I try and show them a tweet thread, they're super confused and have no really? idea who's responding to who. And if you just uh, never use Twitter, I kind of get it. I, I know it's like we use it, we're used to it, um, especially when you bring in retweeting because then it's like, here's the thing they're replying to, the thing underneath them. Right. And then there's people replying to the thing above the retweet under that. But... So this would make sense to me for people who are not used to Twitter, but nobody who's not used to Twitter is going to buy a Twitter subscription. Yeah, it would have to be someone who uses Twitter a lot who would want to buy this subscription so they could share these tweet Twitter threads with people who aren't on Twitter very much. Interesting. Um, uh, Other Twitter blue features are purely aesthetic, adds a new color theme option, as well as the ability to change the color of Twitter's app icon, and it gives you an undo feature. We have it. We have edit tweets. There it is. Okay. So that's it. What do you want? (laughs) This undo feature. So it doesn't actually, it's kind of like undo send in Gmail, where it says it will let you within 30 seconds undo a tweet. And that undo tweet is not deleting the tweet you just sent. It just never sent your tweet. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing is when you make a typo, You don't really realize you made a typo right away. Even if you proofread, nobody's perfect. Everyone likes to go, proofread your tweets. Obviously, yes, we try to proofread our tweets. Do you think people who tweet all the time just don't proofread their tweets? Um, Sometimes stuff slips through. You don't catch it. Somebody tweets at you, hey, you meant to say this word instead of that word. This autocorrect got you this time. And so because of that reply that I got really quick, I'll go, oh, I caught it. And I wish I could just edit the tweet, but I'll have to delete it. Mm-hmm. And then repost, and and hopefully that's all fine. Um, with Twitter Blue, if you tweet the thing, and then nobody replies because it hasn't been sent yet, you're not gonna catch the typo that you didn't catch while you were proofreading it. And then it's gonna go out, and then it's gonna see the typo, and then you still can't yeah, undo you're it anyway. Yeah, in the anyway. exact same scenario. It's like you said, people make mistakes, and like I've proofread things multiple times and sometimes like even in the proofreading process you already know what you're reading so in your head you're basically reading exactly how you meant to type it and it's really easy to miss if you type of instead of off or if you type the wrong there like you're saying it in your minds quickly it's really easy to miss and then the first 20 comments when you post it are you used the wrong word of the wrong there yeah i just uh i was just at my high school for uh ceremony and didn't realize until I saw my old yearbook that I had a high school yearbook quote. I think that's why I thought of of and And off. there's yeah. a typo yeah. in that high school yearbook quote. I didn't do that on purpose. I was a pretty good academic student, actually. I can't remember when I made that quote or decided to use yeah. that quote, but I uh, 
it said off instead of of. Was that even my typo? Was yeah, that the that's person the who it... typed it just wrote it wrong? There's also an extra space in there for some reason. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, the point being, I can already see all the comments about like just proofread your tweets. Yeah, well, Mister, you've never made a typo in your life. Or that misses. would work. Or misses. It's great for you. You don't need this feature. But for the rest of us mere mortals, we would yeah. like just the ability to add it and edit a few characters. How much all. would you pay? for a full-blown, exactly how you explained it, edit tweet button. Okay, it, just for this one feature, because there's a couple other features just, I would like. Just that feature. There's a couple other features I would like in Twitter Blue that I would actually pay okay, for yeah, also. I'd like to hear them. And I'll go over those, but if you could just give me this ability to edit a few characters in a tweet that I've been asking for, I would pay at least 10 bucks a month just oh, for that. wow. I'm a heavy Twitter user. I know that's a higher number okay. than most people would give. I, I pay that much for unlimited songs on Spotify. I pay that much for basically an endless library of ad-free videos on YouTube. I would pay that much just to be able to edit you my know tweets. What? As much as I think that's a high number, I think it is most important for people who are, are, would almost consider that a business expense because editing, like deleting a tweet and, and then reposting it isn't really a big deal for the majority of Twitter users. But if you're someone with a large following, you're potentially literally deleting hundreds of comments within the first minute or two. And Mm -hmm. while a lot of those will just point out the typo, like that's, it's an engagement hit that kind of stinks. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that's uh, a, there's other things I would, I would, yeah, I want to know what else you want, would want. And what is the, like, what is the like tier three payment per month to get literally everything you want? Oh God. Okay. So we're talking like Twitter business at this point. Yeah, definitely. I would pay for, Higher quality image processing. That is where, coming, right? Uh, so currently, you do have really good uh, PNG. I think it's PNG processing, and okay. it's uncropped images on Twitter, and that's nice. I would just pay for like a universal, like high quality processing. I would actually pay for this on several platforms, mm-hmm. like YouTube priority processing. I would already love that, but yeah, I would pay for high quality, universal, like un- uncompressed, not uncompressed, but really good processing yeah, of images. Yeah, yeah. That would be great for someone like me who uploads a lot of high quality files, especially thumbnails. And I would I would probably want let me pick one more good idea here. Well, that would be great. I'm pretty sure we all just took new headshots in the studio for like our profile pictures and yeah. all of them just got destroyed. That's in the, mainly yeah. where you want high quality mm-hmm. uploading. It just absolutely destroys. If you've ever looked at your own Twitter banner. It's been ruined. Yeah. It's been ruined. And your profile YouTube picture. YouTube banners also are really, I get it, they have to be all over the place, but like, come on. Yeah. It looks pretty rough. So like the features you have here in Twitter Blue are like, okay, but honestly, totally should be built in for free to Twitter. Like they're not that special or serious. Um, so I would not, if it was available here, I would not be paying for I, Twitter Blue. I do think there's one other thing that could kind of fall in the like, quote unquote, business aspect of this payment is that there's like some sort of advanced customer service if you do do Twitter Blue. So if you need help, I'm assuming copyright stuff or or harassment or imitation and things like that. I'm a, I'm guessing you would have a little quicker jump to the line on trying to figure stuff like that out. So that actually could be beneficial. It's just not fun. Like it's not a fun. You're not excited to pay three dollars a month for that. Yeah, I guess this is a this is a fair introductory price. Um, it's lame, but I'm not, I'm not paying for it. Sorry. Yeah. It's not the one. Uh, what else? I have one more article that I, I kind of read this morning because I heard about it yesterday and I just thought it was kind of interesting. It's, it's pretty quick though. Okay. Um, so yesterday morning around five 30 our time. So we probably five 30 AM our time. So we probably didn't even notice this, but, um, huge websites went offline, uh, Reddit, Twitch, and even Amazon were down for like a little bit. And it's apparently because of they all go through this web uh, platform called Fastly, and I guess Fastly was having some issues. Well, The Verge posted an article this morning that I'll put in the show notes. Um, it was actually, Fastly came out with a comment saying that it was triggered by one singular user, and wow. it, it was accidental. They were, it, they quote, was triggered by a valid customer configuration change on their end. So this customer is trying to configure something different with their like completely legal thing we're doing the right thing but they did an update in mid-may and for whatever reason this configuration change hitting that new update caused this massive bug that shut the entire i don't know if it was the entire platform down or something specific but if you're shutting down amazon reddit twitch like 
so something big went down and we're past like one sing or that's a rough buck that's i guess pretty impressive it's just, it's, do we do we know who did no it? they didn't uh, say i think the man. verge's like subline was actually just like fess up who was it we want to know <laughs> um but wow. it even got to the point where some uh uk government sites were actually on the same platform and they were taken down and people were like having trouble accessing that's interesting. like government things they had to turn in it's funny because sometimes you know large swaths of the internet all go down at once because mm-hmm. they all use the same services like AWS or something, Amazon's oh, yeah. web services. A lot of sites use that. And as soon as AWS goes down for a little bit, a lot of websites yeah. all at once don't work or barely work for a while. Um, so it's kind of funny that Amazon would be one of the large sites to go down because <laughs> yeah, of someone else's service is going yeah. down. And Twitch is owned by Amazon, right? I guess I don't know exactly what Fastly does, um, but hmm. yeah. I just thought it was crazy that someone, uh, you see, I mean, usually when you see those places go down, though, it's a targeted attack, and they, like, explain that it's a targeted attack. They have to figure it out and try and stop it, but this was just some poor customer. Like, imagine calling back, like, oh, yeah, that bug you you inherit, like, figured out the other day, or, or you couldn't make your configuration change. Yeah, you took down Amazon in the process and some UK government websites. Yeah, at um, 5.30 in the morning, that's a, too. That's a pretty brutal mistake to make. Um, Sick bragging rights i think i guess yeah i just thought that was pretty funny all right we got to talk about wwdc the worldwide developers conference here's the thing about wwdc we have seen hardware at wwdc before sort of right sometimes it gets unveiled which get people's expectations really high Uh but it is a developer conference like google io and like others so we can't be shocked when there isn't hardware. No, I'm and always, this was an entirely software show this yeah, time. Yeah, I'm always surprised when people say they're like underwhelmed by it, but it's like it's a developer conference. You're not gonna get some crazy stuff. What was it last year? They mentioned M1 or M1 Max, but Apple not Silicon. not yeah. like specifically the the product based on it. So it's like kind of a hardware announcement. The but, Mac but Pro really. got an unveiling at WWDC. Like oh, that was cool. Yeah. Just an unveiling. Like we didn't get to buy it that day or anything. Yeah. But this was just software. So, but we want to go through all these because Apple makes a lot of software. They make iOS. They make Watch OS. They make iPad OS. They make Mac OS. They make HomeKit. They make everything in between. So mm-hmm. they updated pretty much all of this stuff. We could just start with iOS 15, right? That's the that's the yeah. Big, I think that's usually the the big one, the fun one. We're smartphone reviewers. That's usually uh, that's fair. This is what we'll this is what we'll see on the iPhone in September or whenever the newest iPhone, the 13, comes out. This is what will like launch on the new iPhone. And I'll be honest, there was a lot of stuff. I think there's a lot of good stuff and a lot of really thoughtful updates put into iOS 15. Both some some of which that I was expecting, some of which that I saw it and I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. I didn't think they would do that, like the mm-hmm. FaceTime stuff. Uh, matter of fact, let's start with the FaceTime stuff. So FaceTime got a bunch of like smaller things and then a couple big things. Yeah, I think one was like spatial audio added to it, so you can kind of make it feel like you're more in the room, I guess, with people. I sounds it, fine. It sounded like one of those things that's like kind of cool, but you won't really use too much. Yeah, it'll also have uh, portrait mode, so you can turn on blurring your background, which we've seen in others, like Zoom. You can you know just blur your background. I felt in the actual announcement, the example they were using, like the edge detection wasn't that great. It, yeah. Her like whole shoulder was kind of like weirdly, I don't know, it was a little off to I me. have I have never seen good live video portrait mode. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I'm not shocked that it doesn't look that great. If you Have you ever tried Zoom's automatic background blur? Is no. hilariously bad. Like you, I, it'll it'll generally work because it'll cut you out because it can yeah. see your outline. But like you'll turn your head to the side and it'll just leave like a well, blotch that's not blurred out. That's the thing is like zooms. I didn't know they had that, but it makes sense because they have to like replace background. But generally, yeah. when you're replacing the background, you kind of understand this is already a meme, and I'm okay with moving my arm and it just appearing out of the beach, uh, yeah. the like sunset I have set behind me. Um, so yeah, I I I'm not expecting that to be great. I don't expect many people to use it really either. I, There's a couple w- other features that I I think I'll tie in that I could see people using all mm-hmm. at once, but yeah, it's just kind of like a thing you can turn on if you want to. Yeah. Uh share play. 
This is a cool one to me. I did think this was cool. So with SharePlay, you know how you can screen share inside of Zoom or screen share inside of Google Meet or screen share inside of Skype or screen share inside of Teams or screen share inside of whatever you're using. Uh, instead of just screen sharing something, you can actually all pull up the same content at once by using SharePlay. Yeah. So if you have Apple Music or uh, a TV show or Apple TV or something like that, or since there's an API now, any one of the supporting services, you can all be watching the same content at once. I say all because you could have a multi-person FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And it'll all be synced up for all of you. So you know how people do this thing where they'll like FaceTime each other and then watch yep. a movie at the same time I've and done hit it with play? Like my family and stuff, especially during the pandemic. Like it, yeah. it, you are making up ways to do things with people. Yeah. yeah. Now you can watch the movie on your phone or watch it on your Apple TV while you're FaceTiming, mm -hmm. and so you'll have the same playback controls, and you'll be able to fast forward and pause for everyone at the same time, and everything stays in sync. That's pretty cool. I think that's really neat. That's pretty cool. You can screen share now inside of FaceTime as well, which is obviously very useful for family tech support. Shout out to fellow family tech support. <laughs> I'm with you guys. I understand the struggle is real, but now you can you can screen share, so you can like show people how to do things, which is cool. Um, and now also, FaceTime is available for Android. That's definitely going to be the clip title for yeah. 100%. Yeah, kind of. Barely. I mean, FaceTime it, links, it'll I guess, work. is the easier way. Honestly, I think it, I can say that FaceTime is available for Android. Like, it, it'll yeah, functionally yeah. do almost all the same stuff. You can't initiate a FaceTime call from Android, but if you start a FaceTime call or schedule a FaceTime call, you can send people a link to that FaceTime call where they can join. If they open it on their iPhone, it'll open in FaceTime. Mm -hmm. If they open it on the web from their Android phone or from their Windows desktop, for example, they can still join the FaceTime call. Yeah. So you can join literally a FaceTime from Android. And they use the ugliest possible Android phone in their little <laughs> FaceTime demo on stage and on their website to this day. Why I don't not? know what phone that's supposed to be. But, hey, you can now hop on a FaceTime on Android, which is a – I never thought I'd I really, be able to say that. Yeah, right. I, I wasn't expecting that. It is like a kind of side way of doing it. Like it's not actually – FaceTime for Android, but the fact that you can still do it. And honestly, most people who are like having FaceTime calls and trying to get a relative or a friend on it, like sending them the link is probably the easiest way of doing it rather than making yeah. them download FaceTime and everything. So, yeah, I mean, there's never going to be a FaceTime app for Android. That's never going to happen. Yeah. But if there was like that one family member who has an Android phone who's been left out of all the, the holiday group FaceTimes because he doesn't have an, a Mac or whatever, yeah, yeah. well, now he's in. Now you're now in. Now they're in. Now they can uh, like they can join the FaceTime as well, which is exciting. But to me, all this stuff to together feels like Apple sort of responding to how often we see this like work from home type culture, or basically everyone doing everything virtually now. Mm -hmm. Where like people are very familiar with Zoom. Like Zoom didn't really have a place no, in no. everyday life until 2020. Yeah, and now everyone knows how to Zoom. And so as long as people all know how to Zoom, Apple might as well just build in a bunch of those features into their video oh, yeah. chat app so you can just keep using FaceTime when you want to do that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I think FaceTime is way easier for the consumer and everything. Like Zoom is – Zoom has a phone app, right? But it's like I've never used it. FaceTime is, is that quick, easy, consumer-based. Like, And people are using Zoom for that now. And I think in the future when we're not always stuck at home, but you know, maybe one of your friends is home and one of your friends is out – phone is going to be the way to do that and FaceTime is going to be much, much easier. So it makes yeah. total sense. I wonder if they're going to start doing Apple briefings and FaceTime. <laughs> Just to, as <laughs> for those, this is such an inside thing, but like uh, briefings right now all, are all happening virtually and they'll do it in like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or maybe like WebEx or, or WebEx yeah. and... Uh, I don't know. They just do FaceTimes now, group FaceTimes, if they Maybe. wanted to. It wouldn't surprise me if they did it just to keep in the Apple ecosystem, but it still seems a little... That would be hard when there's multiple people on it. I mean, they, they have multiple people FaceTimes. How many, how many are generally in a briefing for Apple? Uh, I, it wildly varies. It could be five. It could be 25. Because like 25 would be very hard yeah, that's to true. keep track of. Everybody mute yourself. All right, this next feature, this is actually... I think this is my favorite feature yeah. in iOS 15. So what is it called, actually? It's called li Live Type? That's not what it's called. Live Text. Let me see if I can I think it's it. called Live Text. Live Text sounds yeah. right. Yeah, okay. So inside now of Photos in iOS 15, it will, and actually in, in the viewfinder of the camera, you'll be able to copy and paste and select and do things with text. 
mm-hmm. whether it's actual text, like you pointed at a document or a label, or handwritten text, if you see something on a whiteboard or on a, we have a whiteboard table, so a whiteboard table. Uh, you can, yeah, you can literally point your camera at it, take a photo, and then on that photo itself, you can just copy. You can just hold down, yeah. long press the text, and you can copy and paste it. You can look it up with Siri. You can translate it call if it's a different number. language. If it's a phone number, yeah, you can literally just copy it and tap it and call the phone number right away mm-hmm. from the gallery. Pretty sweet. As I mentioned in our last video, that is exactly what Google Lens does. Like yeah. everything that does, Google Lens has already been doing. Um, but I really like that it's just one one less step and one it was one step closer to being easily accessible by regular people. Mm-hmm. Where it kind of feels a little bit like magic, where if you take a picture of some building somewhere and it happens to have a, a name and a phone number on it, it would be like trying to explain to your parents like oh no you can't actually just like grab the phone number from that building you'll have to like remember it and switch over to the dialer yeah and they'll just be like why can't i just like press the phone number in the picture well now you can yeah like you can just press the phone number in the picture and it'll just work uh i thought that was really smart I think that, do you know it'd be sweet if they could figure out what to do i'm just thinking of this now like how could that really really help my everyday life uh-huh. if i like am on a busy city street and i see a parking sign I wanted to be able to look at that parking sign and just say, yes, you can park right now. Oh, my or, God. Or no, you can't park. So I don't have to decipher the freaking national treasure code on it that like is impossible to figure out, like, yes, I can right now. I think you might have just had a great app idea. Can I park here? I, I don't, not even, like, someone take it. I don't even care about, if that makes a billion dollars, someone just please develop that app because it would save so many people. Uh, there's probably some city lobbyists who wouldn't like that because you're just destroying city revenue. But uh, Send part of the revenue to <laughs> yeah, the city. Right. I don't care. Like If they make money from tickets, which is like such a dumb way of like, I get that you have to make money. But honestly, just the fact that people can't park in certain places, if you live in a city or anywhere near a city, you're I'm familiar sure you with this. This, this is probably yeah. very useful. Yeah, just let me point it at even I just maybe not even yes the sign. No. Maybe yeah. not even the sign. Just, just look at where I'm GPS located right now decide based on the signs of like people have taken signed pictures near here in the past look at those pieces of information and then tell me if where i'm sitting right now can i park here yeah and and how long can i be when i have to be out yeah yes that is a great app idea i'll take one percent i don't even care just make it i thought of it and you're taking a percent i'm not even taking your i just named it i just named it that's all i did i named it? it can i park here oh can i park here yeah uh, it's gonna be like the not hot the hot dog app from uh, Silicon Valley. It just says yes, no, yes or no, yeah, and a time. I love that. All right, but yeah, no, that's that's super yes. useful. I I think Google Lens because right now in an Android phone you can open up Google Lens or or in the viewfinder you can hit the lens button and you can point it at stuff and and use visual lookup and that's been better for me. I've only had the beta iOS 15 developer beta for a day and I've tried it on some things. It can sort of try dog breeds and cat yeah, we, breeds we tried mac which is like the hardest one possible because yeah. we don't even know it but um google lens this is a little gripe off of wwdc i just found out yesterday i think david showed us if you long press in the regular camera shutter mm-hmm. it'll take the picture and then do lens on it correct or i or, think you long press the viewfinder without the shutter button yeah, yeah, sorry. In the viewfinder, yeah, yeah. You yeah. long press there and it'll bring it up. I've always went to the lens thing and then had to like scan a QR code or something like that, which I think is really dumb that it's not in the default. So uh, if anyone out there is like me and needs a quicker way to do lens, there it is. Um, I, I always wonder why QR codes aren't bigger in the US. And I think it's taken way too long to make it a, a quick one two like punch of mm-hmm. getting it. So I think this will hopefully help. Word. But there you go. AI can read text and photos, can decide what's in a photo and look it up for you. Just sort of makes photos live, basically, which is is pretty useful. I think it's pretty it's useful. Very useful. So that was yeah. my that was my favorite feature in iOS 15, but there is more. Uh, there are some small things like you can now use uh, the wallet app to store your ID as a like a photo ID or driver's license, so I actually if you go think that's airport, pretty cool. Well, it's yeah, it's for airports, I think, yeah. right now, or that's where the they'll implement implement it first. But one thing I always do when I go to the airport is I want to take my wallet and my keys out of my pockets and put them in my bag, so on the plane it doesn't fall out. Because like 
when you're traveling state to state, that's the worst place to lose wallet and keys. But I have to keep my wallet in my pocket until I get past security. So if mm -hmm. I can just pack it when I want to and still be able to make it through security, I think yeah. that would be really nice. Yeah. Hopefully it works. They say it'll work with the TSA, and the TSA understands what's going on. Yeah, I think so. it's participating states right now, so uh, okay. or will be participating states, so we'll see. We'll see. We shall see. Um, but I, I look forward to that. And there's a couple other small things, like Safari has a sort of a new look to it. There's uh, tab groups. A bunch of these things to me were like, I'm never going to use them, but they're sort of tucked away enough that I never have to care about them, which is fine. So it just adds features for the sake of having some new features and if you ever want to use them cool i never use tab groups so i'm never going to decide to start using them on mm -hmm. my phone in safari but they exist well, now so that's cool are we like well first sticking on ios with tab groups they did move them to the bottom of the screen so at least they're easier to touch i right. do think this is something android did recently or maybe it's just i use the firefox browser or no chrome, chrome browser chrome browser yeah, yeah chrome has messed with this in the past they put the tab bar at the bottom in one of their betas and then moved it back to the top and it never made it that's where i still get tab i can do tab groups on the bottom of chrome uh -huh. um, okay yeah but yeah uh, but i also do think part of the reason they did tab groups is because they at the same time changed they kind of move tabs up. So now instead of having your like forward back URL, um, mm -hmm. what's what do you call that? The URL bar. Yeah, yeah navigation I guess. bar. And then usually tabs are under that. Now it's like all on the same one. So your URL has to take up half of the top of your window and you have less room for tabs. Um, so I'm assuming tab groups is part of that, but it feels too much like a bookmark sidebar it does look I like a bookmark I would, bar. <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't think i would ever want that to be honest yeah um, but it's there it's a little it's a little refresh of safari which is neat um this also applies to the desktop which we'll get to but other than that ios uh basically just new notification stuff which i thought was pretty interesting now there's i've always thought ios notifications are bad and they still kind of functionally are the same as they were, mm -hmm. but they do have some sort of new organization priority happening here. Yeah. So number one, you can get a notification summary of all of your low profile, low priority notifications at the okay. end of the day, which to me is a good idea, but I just don't know exactly how it works. Like. Do apps, does it just know which are the low priority ones? Is it only communication apps that will get through during the day? And then all the things like your random weather notification or a news notification or some random headline or a promo thing, they'll just all show up at the end of the day. Do app developers have to say that their app is a low priority notification or which high is, priority? Like, Why would you ever pick your own if app I'm as an, low priority? Yeah, Exactly. If I'm an app developer, I'm never going to say my yeah. apps are low priority notifications. So. I don't know exactly how it works, but I like the idea of at the end of the day not having like all the random news stuff or just like a hey, it's gonna be hot tomorrow. Like I'll I'll get the the yeah. majority of that stuff out the way just all at once. Then the other thing is focus modes. Mm -hmm. This was cool to me. This felt like uh, almost like like profiles kind of. Not quite, but pretty close. Yeah. So if, if you set them up, you'll see it's pretty cool. You can set a focus mode of like a personal versus work. We'll just use that as the example. Yeah, so that's the easiest a, example. Yeah, a sleep one or do not disturb entirely. But let's say you have a work focus mode. When you set up work focus mode, you can have it only send through notifications from your work apps and whatever contacts you want, probably only your work contacts. And then you can have certain home screens show yeah. up just for work and hide the ones that have the personal apps on them. And then it'll only trigger when you're at a certain location or during certain times of day. So you can have it Was only it? go 9 to 5 or you can have it go when I am at this studio. Mm -hmm. It'll be in work mode. All of that is super cool. And then when you're in work focus mode, when other people in iMessage try to message you, they will get this little away notification or this focus notification. Yep. So they'll know that your notifications aren't on because they're in work focus mode. And then they can send it through anyway if it's important. But that's... Pretty cool. That change gets distributed through all of your iCloud devices mm -hmm. at once. So if I have this work focus mode on my phone and I turn it on or it gets enabled when I'm at work, now my watch, now my iPad, now my Mac, all of whatever devices I have in the ecosystem are all in work focus mode at once. 
that is the next level cool part of this this feature where it's, it's like your profile for all of your devices it's not just your iphone that i thought was pretty cool yeah i think th i mean it's obviously apple and integration between all their products is like what they do best i'm also realizing as i'm looking through our notes it's very hard to organize what we want to talk about because almost everything they announced was available on all everything stuff. else so like we're talking about ios and i've already talked about a on Mac. Mac, Safari, and now we're talking about Focus, which is available on like all of these different things. So, I mean, it's a problem for us right now with Notes, but it's kind of awesome the that they, yeah, it's the it's best a thing good about problem Apple. to have. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I thought that was super cool. It's uh, yeah, you can make custom profiles, so you can have a work one, you can have a personal one, but maybe you also have a golf one where you have only certain people can contact you while you're golfing, and only your golf apps can notify you about how. How You're, many golf apps do you have? I have like four, which is wait, what a, like I don't know. score tracker, fitness. I have a, a one to help book courses. It's called Golf Now. It'll okay. tell you what courses are are open with tee times near you. Are you ever booking a course while you're on a different course? No. Okay. <laughs> but, it, you know, just leave all the golf apps open just in case. I'm on the 18th hole. I'm like, I want to book another round right now. Hmm. Um, no, yeah, that's uh, that's focus modes. That's probably the gist of it. Other than that, iOS is sort of I think just that's like mostly a most of iOS, yeah. Fresh coat of paint, you know, bigger pictures next to notifications is cool. Um, all right, so then we get to iPad OS. Mm -hmm. There's a, a good amount of iPad OS stuff now. When I reviewed the M1 iPad Pro, this was the thing that I think a lot of people had the same general consensus, which is okay, you've done it, you've made the most powerful iPad possible. It does. It has way more headroom than you can ever need. It has 16 gigs of RAM. The thing is crazy powerful, but I can still do exactly the same stuff as I could with the last iPad. When are we going to get some sort of extra functionality to take advantage of this horsepower? Right. So there's a lot of hype for this WWDC, specifically around iPad because of that. Right. Yeah. I feel like they did halfway what I was hoping, Okay. which is... They did make multitasking a little a little bit more intuitive and a little bit faster, but they still it doesn't feel different. And now we were talking on Discord actually with Renee. Uh, we had a stages a channel stages event where we were talking about WWDC stuff, and he brought up a really good point, which is I've been so iPad Pro, iPad Pro, iPad Pro for so long that I keep forgetting that like there's all the other iPads yeah, that also yeah. run iPad OS. And regular people don't really think too hard about that extra horsepower and extra functionality unlock because they want it to be a simple tablet. And it is. And the second you add all that complexity to multitasking and slide over windows and, and yeah, file systems there, that shows up on everyone else's iPads who doesn't really care about that sort of stuff. So they do have this weird, they never want to fork it, I imagine. There's never going to be separate software on the iPad Pro. No, I don't think so. But they do want to take advantage of I imagine, all that horsepower. So anyway, here's what we got. You can now do widgets on all of the home screens everywhere, and there's some new bigger widget formats, which I think are really cool. I am planning a video on all of this, by the way, so we'll have like our full thoughts and everything, mm -hmm. but this is just the first impression. So widgets everywhere is cool. Um, you can now build apps with Swift Playgrounds on the iPad, which is cool, and then test them on the iPad and demo them and run them on different resolutions and yeah, everything. I think you could like probably build a calculator app on there if you wanted. I think you could build a calculator oh, imagine app. Imagine that. Maybe even a weather app on the <laughs> iPad. That would be pretty tight. Uh, and then, yes, there is a new multitasking UI. It's, it's kind of hard to explain just with words, but if you've seen the videos or the keynote demo, basically instead of just being all swipes, you can do a lot of that same multi-window stuff with taps now because when yeah. a multi-window app shows up, you get the three, bar, three dots. You can tap it, move stuff over, create multi-window events more easily. It definitely is a, a, a little more intuitive because each of the little like taps that you would press show like a little graphic that kind of shows what it's doing. So it's definitely easier to be like and not accidentally swipe stuff into who knows where. And yeah. Whatever. Yeah. A lot of the questions I see about this are like, well, Marquez, what, what were you expecting? Like, what did you actually want them to do? And the more I think about this, I'm like, I, I guess I do want... I don't want Mac OS on the iPad, but I do want freeform windows. Like this slide over thing, I've never been into slide over apps mm -hmm. basically, which are the, these column apps that have their own floating area that they can multitask within on the side and then swipe away and hide. I've just never been into that, but I just want the ability to have 
like three windows open where I can do things in each of the three windows and resize them and full screen and then drag it over and move this thing. And I guess I just, I don't think we're ever going to get that on the iPad. If this is if this is where they're at and this is the modification they're making with iOS, iPad OS 15, mm-hmm. then I don't think they're planning on free window movement on any iPad. So I think that is what it is. Like I'm not, I'm not disappointed. I'm more just like, let me try this for a little bit. Let me get used to it and see if it helps at all. But as far as like, Using the horsepower of the M1, like it doesn't seem like it <laughs> added them. You're not yeah, touching the. It's gonna be a while. Yeah, I think the, people were expecting their minds to be blown, and Apple does that sometimes. This just wasn't quite one of those. Uh, yeah, it's not gonna blow which our is minds not, or anything. Yeah, that's totally fine. But it was good. I, I I'm gonna keep using it. Like I said, I'm using the the developer previews right now for both iOS 15 and iPadOS 15. So I'm living that beta life right now. That but, potentially brick your iPad life. Yeah, we'll see. Sounds we'll fun. see how long it goes. We'll see how long it lasts. Um, then I don't know. You're not a you're not a heavy like. I don't Mac use OS. almost any Mac stuff. Or I use I use my Mac Pro at work. I don't use iPhone. I don't use iPad. I think both of them are great. I just don't use them. It's, okay, it's very strange. So like me, all my points given here are all outsider perspective stuff. Yeah, my I use a Mac pretty heavily and the one thing about mac os big sur that i was really getting annoyed with is notifications oh yeah i can tell you I'm it's annoyed very right now. very annoying so I'm, I'm hoping that sort of stuff is fixed but this is the one beta i haven't switched over to yet but there is a new mac os and i keep forgetting the name monterey monterey monterey, monterey. so it's m-o-n-t-e-r-e-y monterey. two e's yeah, I spelled that wrong a hundred times in this, these <laughs> notes. Um, but it is a, a new version of Mac OS, which again gets a little bit of a sleeter, wait, sleeker, on. fresh coat of paint. Is it the same way spelled as like the cheese, yeah. Monter- Monterey Jack, and we have a cheese grater Mac Pro? Uh, oh, wow. Oh, That's... where's the tinfoil hats? <laughs> Where are they at? I didn't oh, even wow, think about that. Is. We just got the confirmation, Monterey. Mm. I didn't even think about that until just now, but... You're right. So we got Monterey cheese, my and we got Monterey. To this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, I pointed the uh, the beta camera at the Mac Pro and asked Siri what it was, and it oh, said, God. "This is either a cheese grater or a Mac Pro." It's yeah. I love that it got it right and sort of, but still wasn't quite sure. Yeah, it, it gave That's me both. Really, I wonder what. Did you try Google Lens? Google Lens said the same thing. Same thing. They both said or? Mac Pro first, but then also cheese grater. Yeah. So I think it was a Google uh, Images thing because on Google Images there are some sure. cheese graters that look exactly like the Mac. Actually, Pro. has anyone made a cheese grater that looks like a Mac Pro? That's uh, a that's a business idea right there. Do you know how many people would buy that? The thing is, people have literally grated cheese on Mac Pros. Yeah, so it sounds like it, it would work flawlessly. <laughs> flawlessly is a stretch. Just shop mkbhd.com. Oh God! Look out for it. Look, if we can charge five hundred million dollars for them, like <laughs> Apple does, then sure. Uh, no, that's. It is definitely a, a a refreshed version of the OS. Mm-hmm. Uh, Safari got the biggest change because it's got that like new sleeker look with the tabs at the top and that like bookmark looking thing on the side with your tab groups. Whatever, I'll give it a shot. I'm hoping for uh, a little bit better notification That'd be support, a nice. little bigger click area to get rid of things because the tiny X is really getting annoying. Um, but yeah, you do have a new Mac OS beta. A lot of good maps features, which again are across everything, which have a uh, new Street View, Street View AR mode. A lot of these like select cities will have these 3D models of landmarks in the cities, which yeah. are super detailed, and that's really cool. Um, but like I said, a lot of the stuff is it's like also, catching it's still up to Google, not Google maps. maps, though. So who cares? I mean, I care because competition is good. And like, yeah. even if you don't necessarily get harmed from using Google Maps, if they're a monopoly, you still want to see like a reason for them to get better. Yeah. Like Google Maps, I feel like I just hasn't really gotten appreciate better. Apple Maps being the meme. Yeah, like I feel like Apple Maps started off as the one that obviously was awful because oh, yeah. it, it had so many problems and all the headlines were hilarious mm-hmm. about it. But now that it's getting better and more useful and usable, maybe it'll actually make Google Maps get better. True. So now that I really think about it, though, I could see it when cars start integrating CarPlay more and more. Like, I do, though, see, I guess I could see, like, improving Apple Maps will just benefit the CarPlay experience. I I think you said you can use Waze and Google Maps through CarPlay, but the more first-party things you do, the better. So Android Auto will have its Google Maps and 
CarPlay will have Apple Maps and all that integration more and more will just make cars in the future way yeah. way nicer with all that. Yeah, I'm a fan of that competition. Um, there was a bunch of other smaller stuff too. Uh, just Wait, announced at WWDC in general because there's always a bunch of software announcements and things like that. What should we What should we hit first? I mean, Cloud I think Plus? Universal Control is like the coolest oh, thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like we gloss over that. Oh, God, it was okay. so good. I think... A perfect example of how cool that is was I was trying to explain to Claire what got announced at WWDC, and it's clearly not that interesting for non-tech people. And then I showed her a clip of Universal Control, and she was like, that was actually really cool. Yeah, like, that was super really cool. Sweet. All right, so for those of you who don't know or haven't seen, God, all right, picture this. So Craig Federighi sits down, he's got a Mac, and he's got an iPad right next to it. Mm -hmm. He sets them up next to each other, and without any other setup, he moves the cursor over to the edge of the Mac, and it just knows that there's an iPad next to it. The iPad wakes up and goes, hey, is there a cursor here? And you just immediately line the two up, and now you're just controlling the iPad with the cursor on the Mac. So it's not sidecar no. where you would be extending your Mac's display onto the iPad. Yeah, yeah. You're just controlling the iPad UI now with the trackpad and whatever mouse and keyboard you're using on the Mac. That's cool right away. Just immediately yeah. knows where to go, no setup, lines everything up, great. Um, he brings another Mac in there. He sets them all three up next to each other. So now he's got a mouse and keyboard and three displays, and it just keeps working seamlessly. That is that is an ecosystem oh. flex right there. But what the coolest part of that is, is not just are you controlling everything, you can now, which I'm assuming is almost just using a quicker version of like Air. I guess I'm confused a little about how this works, but he was dragging files from one to the other. He was dragging a photo file from the iPad and dropping it in like a PowerPoint on his Mac. Yes. Which is wild, but I guess at a certain point with a file size, are you gonna start? Yeah, what so is this the is, difference there? is a, a bunch of different things. This is Bluetooth, first of all, okay. for proximity. So as soon as they know they're next to each other, they're on the same, they can Bluetooth connect to each other. Um, uh, you could already use a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse on the iPad. Yeah, so yeah. this is just using your Mac as a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse for mm -hmm. your iPad. So that's cool. Then you get to that dragging a file from the iPad to the Mac. That's essentially AirDrop. That's what I thought. Which is Wi-Fi. So it's Wi-Fi direct just going straight from one to the other, transferring mm -hmm. the file. So yes, that will still be slower if you have a huge file. Yeah, I but guess it's they, an image, so it was fine. Yeah, they used an image to make it a bit quicker. But I, I could see that being so useful for people who, if there's like artists who are drawing on their iPad with Apple Pencil, but need to bring it into uh, yeah. their like MacBook or iMac or something like that for whatever reason, and that just seems really cool. Yeah, that's the thing about the iPad is at the very highest end of iPad use. I feel like all of those people have a Mac anyway. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm always over here like, oh, I want so much more out of this iPad. It's so powerful, but I want a file system. I want to do everything on the iPad. But at the end of the day, this feature makes it pretty obvious to me that it's going to continue to be great oh, to yeah. have both an iPad and an, a Mac, which is music to Apple's ears, of course. Oh, yeah. But yes, there's a lot of people, even in our own studio, will like finish editing uh, a thumbnail on the iPad and of course, now we want to put it on YouTube. So what do we do? We airdrop that file to the Mac so yep. that we can put it on YouTube. Well, now we're just just swiping over. Do you think you'll have to be logged in as the same iCloud account? Yes. Okay. So yeah. it does so kind of, in the I mean, studio, airdrop is still nice, but yeah. Yeah, in the studio, we will still be airdropping between different iCloud accounts. But if you happen to have something you want to finish on the Mac, maybe you want to export it in a, since we have to crush the file size for YouTube or you want to do something like that, then you would just go to the Mac and then take care of it from there. But nevertheless, very cool demo, really cool feature. It's called Universal Control. Yeah, I think that was the coolest demo they did of all of WWE. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, that's a, you know what's funny about these presentations is like, I feel like there's three things that always happen during an Apple uh, pre recorded presentation. One is they have a super cool tech demo moment. Yeah. where you go, oh, that was a really cool feature. Two is they have some kind of Easter egg, where whether it's like when he was pointing the camera at the whiteboard, there was all this text on the whiteboard about like the next version of like AirPods and how they mm -hmm. test them on dogs and call them AirBuds, I think he said, I on the whiteboard. Completely. Just little Easter eggs, there's always stuff like that. And three, there's always a memeable moment in every single one of these, whether it's Tim Cook literally ripping his face yeah. off or if it's Craig Federighi and WWDC 
jumping through the hole yeah. in the ground to land in the privacy section under the theater. There's just some moment where they create where they're like, all right, this is the meme one. All right, we're shooting the meme now. Okay, great. Like they always just they they nail it. They just set it up. Um, so yeah, they're they're consistent with it. But we did get some cool tech demos out of that. Um, there's some other stuff. I mean, Watch OS eight. A couple small things That's with HomeKit. You get you know intercom on your watch now. You get to this mindfulness app where it'll tell you to breathe and relax, kind of like the OnePlus Stress yeah. app. I'm never going to use this. And the new health feature was um, like a balance kind of thing, like to help uh, understand if people are at a fall risk. Um, we Actually, we didn't see the... And someone actually DM'd me, actually, we talked to about it on a uh, previous episode, but remember we were talking about like blood glucose and stuff like that? Yeah. We didn't see that. Did this, not see that. No. So I guess that might be a hardware change so maybe we wouldn't have expected it but yeah there was small health updates to yeah. it nothing too exciting i did think um icloud plus was pretty cool so icloud plus did have i think probably two main features that were you know new and pretty cool one is oh i'm gonna i want to get the name right it's like dual relay something private it's not relay private relay so it's called private relay it's not quite a vpn yeah but it is effectively the same thing as far as completely shielding your information from your ISP and from everyone else. Um, you can't, like, uh, region gate, like, by using a server in a yeah, different region, yeah. so you can't, like, unlock Netflix France or whatever from this service, but you can use this private relay for complete privacy as far as online browsing, so that's cool. So then the other one was called, it's Mail Privacy Protection. Now, I don't use the stock Mail app in, on a Mac. I haven't in years, but if you do and you have iCloud+, Plus, Mail Privacy Protection will... Basically, look at these uh, these email. Tr You'll get an email, like an ad or something like that, and you can just like close the email and archive it and delete it or whatever. But there are these invisible pixels inside of these mm -hmm. emails where they will respond and send back information to the sender of the email about like when you opened it, whether or not you opened it at all, if you're a real person or not, and all these things can be used to track you. Mm -hmm. And so it'll just take the hit for you and not – it'll shield your location and who you are from those who are sending the emails. So I guess they'll start reporting 100% open rates on people who are using <laughs> iCloud Plus because it'll always just be taking that hit for you. But that I thought was pretty solid. I don't, like I said, use that app right now, but it's a good idea. It's a good feature. A lot of privacy feature focus stuff and, here. And kind of proof that they are – really into privacy because this is coming at no additional price to on top of current iCloud paid users. Yeah. So that's kind of awesome. Putting their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. I like it. Wow. We talked about a lot today. Yeah, Are there's we... not much more. I I wanted to mention one more feature on the okay. watch. Live photo watch face. Oh, what was that? That was, <laughs> yeah, that was weird. I think it's just portrait mode where if you take a portrait mode photo, it does have the depth information to separate the subject from the background. And so then you can set that photo as your watch face. Apparently the number one watch face is photos. People just set a photo as their watch face. I didn't know this. I've never had a photo as my watch face. It'd be cool face. if you could set a photo and then use parts of the photo to be the arms as the clock moving around. <laughs> that might be the next step. That would be cool. But as of right now, it'll just like overlap the subject a little bit in front of the time and the background behind the time. Didn't they do some weird thing where they like scrolled on it and like the face got really big? Yeah, they zoomed in a bit and the subject swelled up a little bit that in was, front of the background. That was just a weird demo. That yeah, was the worst know. demo. <laughs> but like... I say that because I don't care about photos as watch faces at all, but I'm still kind of shocked that photos are the number one watch face. Yeah. That 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 was the lasting impression I got out of that is I didn't realize apparently most people are. Maybe it's not number one by a mile, but a lot of people are no, using yeah. pictures as their watch face. It, it makes me wonder because I've always disliked the Apple Watch because of how much it doesn't look like a watch. But if people are putting real photos as watch faces. Yeah. Oh, but could it also be people? Is this just a weird way to get like a custom watch face too? If you, I mean, you're like uploading a quote unquote photo, which is a design maybe you made. Mm, I don't think that, people are getting that crazy. No. I think they're just uploading a picture they like or a picture they took. Does it still show like minute and hour hands when you do a custom photo one or does it just yeah. do like a digital time? Either one, whichever Either you want. Either one? Yeah. I could see people probably making some third party work around that something that cool. might, that adds into the the statistic that it is a photo as a... I think you're right, but when you think of like the average everyday person... Yes, I think there are a lot of people... It's just a photo on their which phone. Which makes me feel like the Apple Watch is less of a traditional watch anymore and yeah. more of a 
it's a new watch. Tech. Yeah. There's a lot of people my age and younger who have never owned a watch until the Apple Watch, and it's their first yeah, watch. So when they say when you say traditional watch, they're like, I don't want a traditional watch. I just have this thing that I got when I was 14, and it's what I think a watch is. And it's it's not like the main use of it isn't telling time anymore. Adam was just on the Android Central podcast I was listening to the other day, and they were talking about what their favorite part of watches were, and someone was like, no one's mentioned time. Like oh, no, time yeah. isn't the main thing for the watch at all. It's more like a it's a good traditional accessory that now is a place to put tech in you know it's funny i think i still check the time on my phone <laughs> i'm pretty sure i still check the time on my phone i just I, look it's okay. just a glance i oh, can't even like laugh at it i only wear my watch when i'm doing like hiking or or exercise or something like climbing so like i'm still so in the habit of checking my phone that i yeah. do do the same thing but yeah. i would like to think if i wore a watch 24 7 i would start checking the watch but We'll see. Adam has the. We should end this before. Yeah, he's a right. big watch guy, and he's giving us the most disconcerting look right now. That's so funny. All right. Well, we've talked about pretty much everything there is on the last. This is all literally from a two-hour Apple presentation. So obviously, yeah. there's a lot more to it. We have videos in the works about a lot of this stuff. Definitely check those out on the channel when they come out. But it's been WWDC week. Not bad. You guys probably already know, <laughs> by the time we're recording this, Tesla's Plaid event will also happen. We're yes. recording this before the event, then Tesla's Plaid event happens, then this gets published. So we know nothing about it, but it's going to happen between now and the next yeah. release. So maybe the next episode will have more to say about that. Well, they're, they're definitely, well, I deleted like three pages worth of stuff okay. just based on the Elon tweet. So there's plenty to talk about. Um, yeah, just, Plaid Plus getting canceled, all this yeah, weird stuff going just, on. We didn't want to release it when like hours later, or the event would have happened and then ours would have come out a couple hours later and then it just would have been yeah, all over the place. So yeah. next week, expect a lot of Tesla talk. But until then, this has been uh, this has been Apple Week here at MKBHQ. Thanks for I, tuning I in. KBHD. <laughs> I am KBHD. I am KBHD. Thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for the rest of the videos, and we'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.